Welcome back to A Word with Tom Merritt. I'm Tom Merritt, and as you know by now, hopefully, unless you're brand new to the show, uh, there are lots of people out there telling you what to think, but here on this show, we like to talk about how to think, because we all take shortcuts. We all have to filter information. There's there's just too much information out there. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that I learned to do, like how to filter that information from conversations I had with my grandparents. Uh, my grandpa Carl and I would sit in his front room talking about the news of the day, trying to understand it. My grandma Roxy and I would sit in her front room and talk about the stories of life, uh, really learned how life works from her. So I got lots of different ways of looking at the world, lots of great conversations, and it was all training me for this moment right now. Welcome to the front room, Mallory O'Mara. Tom, thank you so much for having me. I l always love having conversations with you. Ah, it's it's the best. Uh, I, I've I've been lucky enough to be on your podcast uh, many you've times. Been, you've been nice <laughs> enough to come on to other ones of my podcast, but but for people who don't know you, uh, how how do you describe what you do these days? I, I normally just say I am a historian and an author. I should say podcaster, mm -hmm. but. Are, are we in an age yet where podcaster can be a serious profession? I mean, I'm talking to an, I asked this to another yeah, podcaster. Yeah, right. No, it's, it's a fair question. We certainly have gotten to the point where I don't have to explain it to my barber. So, you know, <laughs> when he says, what do you do? I do, I do say, I do catch myself saying I do podcasts, not I'm a podcaster, right? Yes. And when uh, I fill out well, that little I, customs I it's... form, I put writer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I never tell customs that I'm a podcaster. I don't want to explain <laughs> yeah, that through, yeah, yeah. A, through a glass. Uh, I normally say, yeah, I'm a, I, I'd say co-host a show. Um, maybe ho the word host adds a little bit of uh, fanciness to yeah, it. Yeah. But saying podcaster, it sounds more, I guess that sounds more like a hobbyist where I have to be like, yes, no, my show pays my rent. So <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah, this is actually my job. And the show is great. Uh, you and Bria Grant do a fantastic uh, job on Reading Glass. It's one of my favorite shows. Thank you. We we work really hard at it. Um, if you were to explain that show to folks, how would you explain it? I always tell people that is it's a book show about reading, not about books. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. if if you are a reader, it's something that you'll pick up on right away. But a lot of folks are like, well, what do you talk about if you don't review books? And we say we talk about reading itself. We talk about the very strange things of reader culture. You know, what's the best book light to use when your partner is trying to sleep in bed and you need one more chapter? How do you get a book back from someone who borrowed it six months ago and now you really want it back? You know, how do you uh, dry off a book that's gotten wet? What's the best way to organize your books? How do you re retain more information when you read? Uh, just th sort of those in intricacies of reading life. So book show that isn't about books is my is my shorthand for it. Yeah. The, one of my favorites was the debate about the orientation of the book when laying down. Yeah. <laughs> It's like a personality <laughs> test, how you answer that. Yeah. Yeah. When people lay on their side, some people keep the book uh, parallel to their face and mm -hmm. other people keep it perpendicular to their face. And we discovered on the show that it is a massively divisive subject. Yeah. Uh, and other, ev whichever way you do it, you are stunned to find out that people do it <laughs> the opposite way. It it's one very, of those uh, kinds of things. Yeah. I'm team perpendicular, of, by the way. Oh, me too. Yeah. Me too. I, I have to have it perpendicular. I feel, I feel silly having it parallel to my face, but that's the sort of hard hitting journalism you get on reading glasses. <laughs> no, it's good stuff. And even if your name is not Sarah, you should go listen to reading glasses. Uh, you'll be very <laughs> welcome there. Uh, you'll get that joke if you become a listener. Uh, you though are a historian like that, that that's yes. for real. You you've published more than one book about histories. Yes, uh, I have uh, my my third book is coming out next year, but I have two books out of vastly different subjects. <laughs> but I, I generally say when pressed, if, if people want more information, I say that I'm a you know, women, women's history writer, women's historian. I'm really fascinated by um, women in history because I didn't get a lot of that growing up. Uh, and I wanted to see myself in history. So uh, my first book was uh, a biography of the woman who designed the creature from the Black Lagoon. My second book was a history of women drinking. And my third book that's coming out next year is a uh, my first children's book and it is a, a book about filmmaking for for young girls and i think it is if not the one of the world's first choose your own adventure nonfiction nonfiction books choose your own adventure nonfiction sounds wonderful like uh, i i can't wait to see how that turns out is is there any any sneak information you can give to explain that 
Yeah, and it's illustrated by my friend Jen Vaughn, who's incredible. And it's uh, it takes you, the reader, whoever you are, through the creation of a sort of a mock movie. And as you move through the book and make choices about your movie, that's how you choose your own adventure. You are trying to make a film, and the goal is to get the film to premiere in Hollywood. And this particular film is a zombie movie film because what kid doesn't want to make their own zombie movie and if you want practical effects zombies you flip to one page if you want them to be cgi zombies you flip to another and through the the experience of doing that you meet all the different people on a film set how they got there what they love about their jobs what tools they use and there's all illustrations of women doing all these things and little bits of history from uh feminist film and women in film. So it's a, it's a ton of fun. I was really proud of myself for writing an entire book without swearing. It's de- again, my first book for <laughs> middle grade readers. Uh, but I'm really, really excited about it. I am very, really passionate about um, uh, the history of women in film and being able to share it with young girls and young kids is really exciting for me. Do you think you could ever get a publisher to agree to publish a book for middle grade students on how to swear properly? Like a guidebook? <sighs> Maybe a small press, like one of those little <laughs> niche presses, <Yeah. laughs> the little, the weird ones. Yeah, yeah. probably. Because kids need guidance, you know, it's, it's. I mean, some of the people out there who've gotten book pub- books published, I feel like I could probably do, do <laughs> You it. can pull that off. <laughs> well, uh, the, we haven't even got to the word for today. And and, and if you haven't uh, seen it in the title of your podcatcher already, the word today is research because. My favorite thing. I, uh, especially those first two books I know, research, y- you put in a ton of research and, and you enjoy it. I do. I am sort of a sick freak in that way. Um, I love, I love research. I, I really, it's to me, it is, it is a uh, f- like ec- hyper-focused reading. Uh, it, it, to me, it, it's like reading for my job, which it is. And uh, I, I absolutely love doing it because it, to me, it feels like there's some sort of investigative element to it. And finding the information that you need is really exciting to me. Uh, you know, any montage in a movie where like someone's going to the library or like looking through old books, like that is catnip for me. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what I want to do. And uh, so I really, really love it. I find it very fun. One of the things that I have found fascinating hearing you talk about research uh, is how many physical books you still need. I think a lot of people would assume like, wow, 90% of everything, you can just go online and find out everything you need. Why do you think that is that you, you still need to get a book? Is it a preference or is it a need or a little mixture? It's actually a mixture um, because there's a lot, especially with the nature of the work that I do, a lot of the the titles that I'm looking for are very old. And so they're, they not, they haven't necessarily been digitized yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I have to get them in print if I want them at all. But I also have a very, I, I actually in the past, in recent years have become um, a fair, a, a pretty decent e-reader for fun. Uh, I got a Kobo recently, and that's how I read a lot of my advanced review copies and library books. Um, So I've I've come around to e-reading, and now I'm a big fan of it, but I have a very difficult time doing it for work when I'm looking really like reading for for a purpose, reading for for research, I have a tough time. I, I like to see a whole page. I like to hold the book in my hands. I I, I really, it's it's just sort of a physical slash mental preference for me. Um, you know, being able to have the book down on my desk and, and look at it and instead of trying to like um, center a page on my on my desktop and make sure it's zoomed in enough that I can read it, but you know, not zoomed in too far that I can only see like one sentence at a right. time. It's just like, I don't like fiddling with that. Uh, I'm not a super tech person, which is why I'm glad you're my friend, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, yeah, so it's a mix. It's a mix of both. If I, um, I have, there's been, a handful of books uh, for for both Lady from the Black Lagoon and Girly Drinks that I had to had to get digitally, and it was it's just tougher for me. I, I I go I go through the information slower that way. I I used to think, uh, you know, when when technology was was just starting to boom, right, and we first got smartphones and tablets, and everything could be done digitally, right. We finally got to the point where you didn't you didn't need paper, you know, mm-hmm. you you could replicate everything. I used to think, well. I'm being old fashioned if I use paper, either for note taking or for 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 reading. But I I, I think what you're describing is something that I, I've sort of slowly accepted, which is there are just some advantages to the form factor of the printed word, uh, it, whether you're printing it with your pen or or reading it printed on a page. 
Absolutely. And I think a lot of it is just sort of sense memory. Um, and as, this is something I've seen described by a lot of print readers is that uh, when I am researching and I have the book down on my desk and I have my pen in my hand, it's I, my brain is like, ah, we're in research mode right now. Whereas if I'm looking at the screen of my computer, I could, uh, my brain is like, what are we doing? Are we on Twitter? Are we researching? Are we mm. writing emails? Like, so, but there's something about having a highlighter and my notebook and everything. It clicks into place. My brain is like, yes, time to focus. It is research time. I suppose you could train yourself that the computer is also research time, but it's harder, like you say, because you use it for so many other things. And I wonder if if just the physical motions also save the information in your brain differently. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's why I got I finally got into e-reading when I got an e-reader, because it's a dedicated thing for e-reading, uh, where my brain is like, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're reading here. Whereas if I tried to read e-books on my phone or a laptop or my desktop, my brain, again, is like, well, why don't we check Twitter? Why don't we look at Instagram? Why don't we text your best friend? Like, what do you we can do? We can do anything right now. Whereas <laughs> yeah, right. I really like uh, and I'm sure you actually I don't know. Maybe you don't have a similar experience. But um, as someone who works constantly on the computer, I very much crave those moments of like, OK, no, we're doing something else. Mm -hmm. I like separation uh, for things. And so I think that is that is part of it. Yeah, there's there's something to taking a break uh, from technology that it, that I've also experienced. But sometimes just changing to an audiobook is enough. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm technically using technology, I'm not holding the phone, tapping it, you know, that that can be that can be different enough for me. I totally agree. I also find a difference between reading for fun and reading for work. Right. Yes, so there's, absolutely. There, I can read any piece of fiction on my phone. I have even gone back and forth between a hardback and, and like, there's no sync. I just have to do the sync manually, but gone from a hardback. It's, it's Tom Merritt sync. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's <laughs> manual, <laughs> manual sync. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, if it's for fun, that's fine because I'm like, oh, well, I'll remember what's, what's important. Whereas if I need mm -hmm. to take notes or then, it's harder on a screen. I do it every day because I'm reading websites, right? And there's there's yeah. no there's no printout, and it would be very wasteful for me to print out all the websites <laughs> <laughs> I read every day. Uh, That'd be for isn't that what what older people do now? People in their sixties are still and seventies are still printing things out. Like you don't need to print that website. Yeah, out. I, it was it was a few years ago, but I, I've heard there are still executives that do do this. That that somebody told me that they got a job at a at a TV studio. And they were a producer and they would go meet with their executive producer and that executive producer had their emails printed out mm. every morning by their assistant and brought in to them for them to read. <laughs> I have heard, I won't name who it is, but there is a friend of mine who <laughs> tried to, um, I know this is a little up to, off topic, but this is a very funny story. A friend of mine who tried to interview for, for their show, this very famous author who is much older. I think this author is in their seventies or eighties. Mm -hmm. And this author now only interacts with emails. Their assistant prints out those emails and brings them down to the local pub where this author hangs out and okay. <laughs> physically hands them the printouts of the emails. And when I heard that, I said, that is what I want my life to be when I am older. That I is what I say. want. As ridiculous as the printing of the emails is, I kind of love that. Like, I'm just oh, hanging out at the pub. Bring me my emails. <laughs> you know? Bring me my emails. Uh, but yeah, I, I, Were they, I Are I they totally... on vellum? Like, I, I want oh, them to be like they really- They unscroll the yeah. email. <laughs> Un <laughs> unroll it, roll it across the desk or roll it across the, the bar top. Oh my God, what a Using dream. a quill um, to compose your answers. <laughs> oh, that is that truly is. I'm going to make a vision board with this. This is what I want. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I absolutely completely agree. And that's one of the reasons why I know a lot of writers who are coffee shop writers mm -hmm. or who love to go write places. But as a nonfiction writer, um, I do not travel light. You know, I write, mm -hmm. uh, I start all of my books longhand. So I, I think Girly Drinks was 13 notebooks long. So it, wow. it would be very silly for me to roll up to the coffee shop with a wheelbarrow. <laughs> and I have my laptop, my notebooks, my pen, my backup pen, 15 uh, books that I'm looking through. Like I just, it, it is not, it doesn't work for me like that. So yeah. I, uh, I like, I'm a, I'm a home writer. I like to hunker in my office. And that's another reason why I just like to have my, uh, 
you know, my books spread out. I, you can see, that's the other thing too, is I like seeing multiple things at once, especially if I am kind of like um, forming my opinions and ideas about this one concept. It's it really helpful for me to see them all spread out. And you can't, unless you have the world's biggest desktop computer, it's very hard. Or, and I know people who have multiple screens, but sure. I... Uh, I am not that fancy. Um, so it would, it's very helpful for me to see them all at once. And it's harder to do that with eBooks on a screen. There, there's absolutely something to do that to, to that. Because when I, when I went to a 34 inch screen from a 27 inch screen, it was a, it was a big revelation. Like, Oh, I could have more in front of me. Uh, but it's still limited to that. Yeah. Even if you do multiple monitors, it's still limited to that. There's no limit to places you can put books and papers, uh, yeah, there's, I, I guess there's like, well, you know, those are on the floor, but you've got a floor, yeah. <laughs> you can put them there, yeah. right? If you need to, like you cannot take that webpage and slide it down to the floor. Like there's just no uh, way to do that. Right. And I'm sure at some point we'll have Ray Bradbury esque smart houses sure. where we can put things all anywhere you that just we project want in the everything house. everywhere. Right. Yeah. Yes. But again, I'm not quite there yet. Um, and there is something very, you know, I, 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 this is such a, a snooty reader thing and I'm very pro e-reader and I'm super pro audiobook. Um, but for me as someone who's been, uh, a reader for pleasure for most of my life, um, as soon as I could read, there is something very tactically pleasing about shutting a book. Again, like I love, like I, I always feel like that scene in Fellowship of the Ring where Gandalf is looking through all the, that old library trying to find the lo like information about the ring. You know, when I have a bunch of stacks of books everywhere, and I'm just like, oh yeah, I feel it. Just like I love the feeling of it. So, uh, and I know that's not for everyone, and everyone writes very differently. But for me, that's that's why I like it, and. Uh, it, sometimes it is tough. Again, like you said, uh, I read a lot for my books, girly drinks. I read, I, I lost count after 500 um, different pieces of media, books, articles, cookbooks, documentaries, inter like this, you know, there was so much, but, uh, and it got a little unwieldy. I end up, I actually have an almost entirely blank bookcase in my office. Um, and some people might look at it and be like, oh, don't you have any books for that? Uh, but that's where I keep uh, storage space for my library halls and my research mm. books, because there are times when it could be that full. Uh, when I go to pick up research materials at the library, they bring me out boxes and they probably hate me. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's that many books. Uh, and that's um, but I like it. Your, your, your empty bookshelf is like a, a memory cache. You know? You yes, that's a good way to, to think about it. And it is. Um, it's actually empty right now because I just finished research on my fourth book. Uh -huh. um, but it's uh, it, I'm always very grateful for those empty shelves when I bring those boxes home from the library and I can sort all the books out and put them everywhere. And it's so it's a, it's a fluid shelf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you decide on sources when you're researching things? How do you decide? Because, you know, th there's going to be some things that are very clearly credible. Uh, but if you want to tell mm -hmm. a complete story, you've, you've got to explore everything that's out there. How do, how do you determine whether something's worth paying attention to and including and, and all of that? Oh, that's a great question, uh, especially with the, the work that I do as I'm often rewriting or writing women back into history. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it this a lot of the um, like when I start out on a project, I it, it's I, I sort of have just like a mass approach where I try to get as much information as I possibly can about the thing. Uh, just like I just cast out a wide net. Mm -hmm. And um, when I start getting those materials in, the first thing I look at is like, who who wrote this thing? Who in who stands to benefit from it? You know, that's a really great way to look at research. And when I was work like my last book, Girly Drinks, a lot of the materials that I was finding, they were written by male authors and they would contain almost no, if any, information about women's history. This is also a huge thing when you're um, working on books that like a good example, if you, depending on the sources you look at in early American history, you know, enslaved African people didn't do this and they didn't do that. And then you're like, wait, no, this is just Oh, this is where I, this, the this, the non swearing part is going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is just crappy racist 
garbage history that is completely useless. And then you read, you know, other, you know, a, a point of views from from other better historians. And you're like, oh, wait, no, they just these other people forgot all of this stuff. So that's I, I really do pay attention very closely to who is writing it and mm-hmm. who if, if if possibly they benefit from it, um, what their biases might be. And I'm not saying that, you know, everyone has these, but it's something to be, you know, the world is, is in a vacuum. And we do, you have to kind of contend with those cultural uh, and societal forces when you are paying attention to this stuff. And that's, I mean, that's a good lesson to look at anything when you're looking at news stories, opinion pieces, anything, it's always good. Like who wrote this and you know, where do they, what's their background and yeah. what, how are they benefiting from the ideas that they're presenting? So it's, um, and it's hard to do that. You know, we're so nowadays we're so bombarded with things when I was, and when I was working on this book, you know, I was, it's a pretty big subject, it's a world history. So I was doing this for every part of the world, every time period. It was a lot, but um, I enjoy doing that. Some people find that looking behind, because you're like doing research on your research, which is, it's a lot of work. I'm not, I, I, I definitely can't lie and say that it's easy, but especially with today, uh, where there's such a contention or so much contention around uh, sources, whether things are, tr- are true mm-hmm. or not. It's something that uh, is really, really important to do. If you are a person who is writing or is, uh, you know, presenting these ideas as facts to the world. Yeah. Ha- ha- having, having the basis uh, to defend those as, as the facts that they are that you chose, you know, and, and how you got there is incredibly important. Uh, it's, it's a very journalistic, uh, premise to, to say, consider the point of view of the person providing the information. And that's not, if I, if I have this right, it's not the same as invalidating it. It may be, or may no, not, not it's, at all. It, it, it could be a, you know, uh, a, a, an Englishman from the 17th century writing something and still be useful. You just have to consider like, oh, OK, well, I know what this person's assumptions and, and cultural context were, right? Absolutely. And that's that's especially important uh, in science research as well. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, well, this study proves this. And I'm like, well, who funded that study? Mm-hmm. You know, is, and how many is, other is, people found the same result? Yeah. So it's, uh, and yeah. again, it can be very frustrating. It can be very tedious, but if you want to be the, if you want to be informed, um, you know, I feel like it's getting harder and harder to be informed mm-hmm. or, but while, while at the same time, it's getting easier. <laughs> uh, it's easier because, to get overwhelmed. I, I often, yes. uh, liken it to, you know, the ready availability of fats and sugars, right? For, for the longest time, that was real hard for humans to get a hold of, which is why they taste so good. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and now we're in that with information. There's, there's way more information yes. than we can use. But at the same time, we have the ability to look people up, to Google people, whereas before yep. we didn't. So things, again, are both easier because you can do that, but harder because there's so dang much yeah, of yeah. it. Uh, so it's a it's an interesting time um, to be a consumer of things, uh, to be a writer. It's um, definitely th- things things change fast. As a researcher, that's great. That's better because you have more avenues to make sure of what you're you're saying and what you're writing. Uh, but as a researcher, that also means you know when you're reading something outside of that area of expertise that you don't have the time to do all of that for everything. How do you deal with that? How do you how do you deal with you know just your everyday information? Oh, well, I, I, not so well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it, any it, of us do though. I don't think that's you. That's you. Yeah. It, it's funny. You can always tell, um, like, uh, 2020, which obviously is sort of a, a, a weird year <laughs> understatement of the, least, of the century. Right? Uh, but I was looking back and, you know, for my show reading glasses, I always like to see how many books I've read in a year. And I looked and I was like, man, what a low, I, this is the lowest reading, reading tally I've had in years. And then I was like, wait a minute. I also wrote Girly Drinks this year and I read yeah. over 500 books. Um, so I do find that my capacity for taking in news uh, is is definitely lessened. Um, I think that's what's interesting is that's why um, outlets like Twitter are both so good and so bad, because with Twitter, you can see such a, a massive aggregate of what happened and then everybody's opinions on it from, you know, the world's most well-informed, smart journalists and the world's creepiest 
basement dwellers who love to yell at women on the internet. So it can be great for me because it can um, very quickly, if something like a sort of some some story is being reported in a weird way, someone on Twitter is going to be pointing it out. And there's a lot of sort of um, uh, freelance and um, sort of alternative journalism like that is really great. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same, you know, while you get people who are doing really amazing uh, social justice work and fantastic anti-racist work and stuff like that, at at the same time, you get, you know, people like Alex Jones and stuff like that. Uh, So it's it's very uh, that it all comes back to, you know, who is giving you this information? How are they benefiting? Are they monetizing this Mm -hmm. in any way? So that's what I've, I've gotten gotten it down where there's certain places that I like to read things and get my information from. And uh, then I can get my, my news a little bit distilled and then have time to read 5,000 books for the, my next project. Yeah. I think that's always the trick is that we can't all be doing what Mallory did for girly drinks for every single topic in our lives. Uh, yes, you know, absolutely. Like that's just not possible. And there's kind of this old fashioned assumption of like, well, do your research. It's like, well, do you know what that means? Like, how do you feel when people say do your research about stuff like that? That must ring differently for you than for other people, I would think. For sure. And it makes me laugh, too. Um, it, it's just a. Uh, <laughs> Um, that's all I do, man. Um, and, but it is, like you said, you can't do that for, for everything. And with every, especially now where there's, you know, with COVID and there's in politics and there's so much that I can very well, I can easily see how people can get overwhelmed because they're, you know, in the early days, people were angry because people weren't taking the CDC's guidelines seriously. And now people are upset about the CDC's guidelines at all. So I can understand where people have a feeling of like, okay, well, if I can't trust this and I can't trust this, where, where do I, how Mm -hmm. do, who do I pay attention to? Who do I trust? Trust is a huge thing right now in media. Um, It is a, uh, for people who are like, oh, go do your research. I'm like, great. Are you going to do someone's job? Are you going to babysit for them? You're going to do their their job for them. It definitely is a tough thing. Yeah, I think we're just as a society developing those skills because we've, yes. like you say, because we've never had so much information available. And also, it's a skill that is rarely taught. I think mm-hmm. early on in school, you get taught the difference between a primary and a secondary sc- source. And then you have to like cite something for an essay And that, unless you are getting some sort of advanced degree, uh, it, you're, it's very, uh, it's very rare that people are taught those skills of researching. I taught, I recently did a special one-off uh, class for one day um, for MFA students for who were interested in doing like creative nonfiction or nonfiction because they just didn't know how to research. And it's, it's a skill that isn't, um, it, I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to say is that it is a skill and a lot of people don't realize it. Yeah. And, and we didn't need it as much when you only had three networks and a couple of daily newspapers, because the bad side of that was the information was limited and you didn't get the full story. The good side was you didn't have to, to have the skill of knowing what to trust because you didn't have that much to choose from. Right. You you picked a TV show, you picked a TV network and a, a, and and a newspaper and, and that was it. Maybe, maybe if you got frustrated with one, you switched to the other one, but that uh, Mm -hmm. we now have an endless continuum of types of information. It's a whole different situation. It absolutely is. And I think that is something that's also contributing to a lot of the, the generational warfare that's happening is that kids growing up today don't know, have no idea what that is like. And people like us who are kind of on the cusp of that have, have our, had, had our feet in both worlds Mm -hmm. and know, and whereas people who are of an older generation, they don't even, they they can't even begin to understand what how much is out there. So I think it's it definitely widens the the gaps in between generations, g- different generations being able to understand each other. Yeah, I think sometimes uh, it's possible that the old forms are actually more distorting than the new ones. Uh, Absolutely, and, and we focus on the new ones because they're new, and we don't understand them as much, but. I, I would present that MSNBC and Fox News are treated by the people who watch them as if they are the ABC, CBS nightly news of the 50s. 
but yep. they're not. They're not even news. They absolutely I, I got an argument with my father-in-law about this. I'm like, you you watch your show. That's fun. But it's enter- just remember it's entertainment. It's not it's not news. Yeah, it's opinions. Yeah. It's all opinions. It's not it's not actual news. And uh that but that's very I, again it's a research and being able to discern the validity of information is something that is not often taught. And for that generation who was a not taught it, but also never had to worry about mm-hmm. it is uh, very confusing. The thought of, of uh, a channel called something, something news, and it's not delivering news is seems very, it's, it's very baffling. And yeah. I try to have as much uh, sympathy as I can. Sure. Uh, you know, we, so many people are out there having co- frustrating Fox News conversations with their in-laws or their parents or grandparents. And I, I do my best to kind of have some, some have a little kindness and understand how, um, how baffling that must be. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and not just, not just Fox, it, it's got NBC in the name. It's like, yeah, but that's not the NBC news that's, that's on in the evening. That's, it's, it's doing the same thing just for a different crowd. I, I think we are in the valley, so to speak, of building up the new credible resources. And we haven't got there yet. There's a few possibilities. There's uh, there's like the information uh, dot com. There's the conversation, which I, I like very much. Uh, these are independently funded, like they hire top quality journalists and stuff like that. But but you can't I, I wouldn't feel comfortable, po- even though I love the conversation of pointing people like there's your source. That's the one because it's going to be different for different people and the types of information they need. Yeah. Uh, and we have to build up that new system for saying, okay, here are the trustworthy sources so that you don't have to do your research for every single thing you want to believe. You you need to be able to to trust a few sources, right? Well, that's what's what's really freaky is the thought that depending on where you're getting your news from and where you're getting your information from, you might live in an entirely different dimension mm-hmm. than somebody else. We see that with news. I see that all the time with history and the work that I do. Like if you – I have several books that are – purport to be, you know, the world history of drinking. And I'm like, but you left out a whole gender, sir. Um, But if you read though, like, uh, this is a very small example, and is specific to me. But if you read that book, and you're like, oh, it's the complete history of drinking, you would just assume that anything that was left out didn't matter or didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you read girly drinks, you're like, oh, there's a million cool women who did all this stuff. How is it possible that they're left out? But those are two totally different worlds. And you see that a lot with news, uh, depending on if you were watching things that are hyper conservative or hyper liberal, you're quite literally living in a different world where different things are happening. And it is very strange. Yeah. I will admit something embarrassing now. Uh, I grew up thinking Asians didn't drink for a couple of reasons. One was every time I read about drinking, it was about the Irish <laughs> and Europeans in general. Right. But, yeah. but, but it, there was the stereotype of, of mm-hmm. uh, people that I'm descended from of like, the, this is where drinking and drinking is Germans and Irish. Uh, and then the responsible drinkers, of course, the English uh, and the French with their wine and that's it. And I was told by people who didn't know what they were talking about. Like, oh yeah, they, they don't drink in China. Uh, turns out my wife who's Asian, uh, she drinks, uh, as does her (laughs) entire family, as does the entire continent of, of Asia. As does every single culture in the world. Um, um, but that's the kind of thing where it did, you know, and thankfully I didn't go most of my, very much of my life uh, thinking of that. But but it was a surprise when I was like, wait, what is sake? I didn't know they had alcohol over there. Like, uh, and, and it was because I didn't have that source. I didn't have yep. that reliable source that that would have, when the person told me the wrong information, I was like, well, wait a minute. I've been reading this history and it because it, it, it wasn't included in there. It wasn't contradicted in there either. It just wasn't included. Yep. And I mean, there's a a great example is the uh, indigenous peoples of North America, something that was a a 
myth that was passed down for a really, really long time and is written in different history books is that there are the native people of this continent um, have a predisposition to alcoholism. Uh, uh-huh. And that yeah. was a- that's absolutely completely biologically false. Uh, but it was a myth that was perpetuated because uh, very uh, and this is very nerdy drink stuff, but the ability to drink and the ability to hold down your alcohol has been so sh- so closely associated with power and social power throughout the ages that it was a way for white settlers to look down upon native like native people and be like, see how silly they are. They 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 can't have a civilization. They can't even hold their alcohol when really they were like plying them with mass amounts of terrible stuff at any time. And they were uh, and the, the funny thing is that there's a belief that. Um, you, you know, you were taught the way that you um, express yourself when you're drunk is something that's learned. Mm. And so a lot of so a lot of uh, uh, people are like, well, maybe they were just acting drunk because that's how the white people were acting. <laughs> but um, but yeah, again, it's, it was just a myth that was perpetuated to put forth, you know, a racist agenda. Yeah, yeah. Um, but because it was, you know said so often in, 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 in history books, there's a lot of people who grow up thinking it's real. And, it, you know, it's, they're just living in a totally, depending on what, where, what your the information you have and where you're getting it, it's, uh, you're just living in a totally different world, <laughs> totally yeah. different dimension. Uh, one of my favorite favorite, favorite nonfiction writers who I think is uh, a genius. And I actually think she got the MacArthur Genius Grant recently or last year, maybe the year before, is a a woman named Tressie McMillan Cottom. And she is an just absolutely incredible woman. And um, she wrote a book called Thick, which is a great uh, book of essays, Lower Education, which is a great book on um, college. And um, she wrote an incredible piece last year about reading around a subject. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is not often taught in English courses or uh, if you're getting your MFA or whatever, when you're you're taught how to write and it's how to like, she was talking about it in, in uh, the, in relation to her, the essay that she wrote about Dolly Parton. And so she couldn't just read about Dolly Parton. She also had to read about the South and country music and, um, you know, maybe the history of blonde hair, just like uh, reading sort of, uh, as she calls it around a subject and being able to uh, not just know what the information about a certain thing, but also the context of it in, in history or in culture Mm -hmm. um, and other ancillary subjects that contribute to its place in the culture. And um, it's, uh, I'll, I'll I'll try, I'll find the essay for you and send to you. It's a really incredible essay, Uh, but it's a, it's a skill to learn how to do that and to be able to instinctually, uh, not in, maybe not instinctually, but you know, automatically know like, okay, well, I want to learn about the subject. I need to read around it as well. Is something that uh, you really have to cultivate and work hard to learn. Yeah, it it for whatever reason it reminds me of uh, a habit I've gotten into. If I'm going on a trip somewhere for the, especially for the first time, I will try to read anything set there. So there, there's reading travel books and stuff, right? But then reading a, a reading fiction set there because it will throw things your way that you won't get from even a history or a travel yeah, book. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and you'll be like, oh, wait, this is the place where, you know, somebody uh, cast the magic spell in this sci-fi that I – well, it would be fantasy if it was magic spell. But anyway, you get the picture. <laughs> uh, you know, and it makes it more exciting to be there when you're visiting whatever that place is. Yeah. And it's honestly, even if you are writing fiction, research is really important. I'm sure you know, as a sci-fi author, um, when I I, I taught that that class, I was really excited to see a lot of fiction writers in there because – you know, when you are, when you want us, maybe you want to write a historical fiction, or even, even if you want to write a fantasy book, it's nice to either get inspiration or just know how certain places work. There's a, um, a huge, you know, controversy online about how people are always like, oh, well, you know, Game of Thrones is really, is really accurate to the time period. And then other people are like, yeah, but Game of Thrones doesn't exist. It's a, it's a yeah, fantasy right. thing. Yeah. But the people who work on that show definitely try to ground it in real things and, sure. you know, do a lot of, you know, George R. R. Martin has said that it's based off, uh, you know, that series has drew, draw a lot of inspiration from the War of the Roses and stuff like that. So um, even if you are writing something that has dragons in it, it can really help you to be able to get inspiration or see how peoples who are similar to the peoples in your book might live, their culture might be. It's a, uh, what I'm trying to say is no matter what, if you are a, a writer, it's hard to escape research. Yeah, yeah. 
a, a little bit of truth sells the lie, which is usually meant yes. to warn you against being scammed, but it also applies to writing fiction, right? <laughs> 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 either a weird infomercial or a fantasy novel yeah, it works either, the same works way. way it's like any tool it can be used for good or ill um, <laughs> to sell weird kitchen yeah. products that cook five to 15 burgers at, at a time <laughs> or to make a best-selling fantasy novel you know it's all the same structure how do you try to make sure you don't contribute to the problem Right. Like it's 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 I think a lot of us, uh, you know, sitting on Twitter can throw stones at, at the people spreading uh, spreading lies or, or something and assume it's it's, you know, from malicious intent. But when you're researching, you're trying to get as accurate as possible. And how, how do you correct for your own biases, your own POV and make sure that you're 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 not getting in your own way, if that makes any sense? I mean, really, it's, you're trying to get to – it's a special – not just a primary source, but um, like, for example, when I was like, okay, well, all this – these books about native peoples in North America that I'm reading seem like they're written by white people and might have some in, uh, information that is not only historically incorrect, but it's also biologically incorrect. Uh, so I immediately went and found as many books as I could that were by native indigenous authors, you know, go straight to the people that are being written about. Um, that really, mm -hmm. really helps, you know, and, and you see it a lot with, with news stories, you know, uh, talk to the, people who are actually there, mm -hmm. uh, people who are actually affected by this stuff. Uh, and it's, that is often where you find the most, the, the, the most truth, you know, yeah. in history, you can never get totally true, uh, which is very hard for people to accept, but it's true. You know, everybody has their own, as soon as a, an event happens, everyone's remembering it differently. It affects other people, affects different people differently. But, um, uh, the way that I, I think is the best way to, to find information is who it's affecting the most, Yeah, you know, who it was, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, who, who was involved and, um, who was, uh, history is written by the victors, but I think you need to read the uh, the loser as well to get the full picture. <laughs> yeah, um, and and sadly, the loser often isn't given a chance to write, so you know you have to yes, work a little harder. Yes, which makes my to... my job very difficult. Yeah. Do you ever worry that when you find something and you're like, oh, this this is what I was looking for, this is this is what I expected? Uh, do you ever worry that that's not credible because it's too close to what you wanted? So what I normally do is um, not just reading around a subject. I call sure. it making a big Venn diagram. So I'll get a bunch of different sources and a bunch of different perspectives and I'll put them all on top of each other. And normally where they all overlap mm -hmm. is where I want to be. Yeah. Um, and that is really helpful. But again, it, that's required. So it's not just reading one book. It's reading two, three, four, five, six. Um, but that's how you find the the people who have been written out. Uh, that's how you um, – because it's normally uh, the broader history uh, is, is where you start, but that leaves a lot of people out. But then you get the more individualized account from, you know, maybe people who were, again, were not the victors. And then you sort of fit them together. And the, the, and the places where they fit together is where I, I normally like to write. I, I use a similar uh, method in in writing tech news uh, when I'm not and and for my show I'm I'm not generally talking to the direct sources. I will write up a version based on one source like The Verge, let's say. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I'll look at what TechCrunch says. Then I'll look at what the Wall Street Journal says. Then I'll look at what Ars Technica says, and. I'll start throwing out a few things. I'm like, no, oh, I'm not seeing anybody else say that, but everybody's pointing this out. Like, it, yes. And it does help some of the cream rise to the top, so to speak. Yes. And that's, again, it's, it's still a lot of work, yeah. um, which is why it's, it's so, it's such a huge relief when people can find websites or things that they feel like are good sources for them and they don't have to read, you know, 15 different news sites. Um, but um, I mean, for me as a, as a, as a history writer, it is, uh, I, I like doing all of that reading. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for doing all of that reading. For us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think historians, uh, especially good ones like yourself, uh, d deserve a lot more credit than they get for, for digging in. And I think people have this idea that, oh, research, you just, you know, grab a couple books, uh, read a couple articles and now you're an expert and that's, that's not how it works. No, like um, a, a good example, my first book, um, 
and this is really, really important when you're trying to prove something. Mm. In my first book, I was proving that uh, it was not who was previously credited with this cre- the creation of the creature from the Black Lagoon. It was this woman, Millicent Patrick, who had designed it. And um, all the people who had claimed that this other man had had designed it, um, had an, I was like, you all have a reason for saying this. And Mm. then when I went and found the accounts of the other people who worked on it, the guy who sculpted it, uh, the guy who sculpted it was like, Oh no, it was her. And I was like, I'm trusting him. You know, he's the one who was physically there, like actually with his hands handling the thing, you know, that she was working on. And he was like, Oh yeah, it was her. I was like, why, why has it been such a big um, uh, (laughs) debate for so many years? You know, when you just get, I, you know, I looked at a different source that was far more credible who did. And this guy had no reason. I mean, it didn't matter to him either way who he was saying it. Um, So it's a, it's that kind of just, when you're when you're trying to prove something, especially, and yeah, it's the yeah. same thing with news, it's it's extra important. Well, it, and it and it shows that that you can't just rely on the Venn diagram that we were talking about. Yes. You need multiple tools because the Venn diagram would show that the wrong person invented it because so many people repeated the the statement. So uh-huh. you 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 look for well, wait a minute, I've got two pillars in my Venn diagram. Why this one may look yes. a little shorter, but why is that? And questioning the sources and stuff gets you there. It sounds sounds like that's. Yeah, it's like to bring it all back around to what we were first talking about was investigating like, okay, well, do you have a reason for saying this? Are you benefiting at all from this story from saying it this way? Um, and, are you the uh, person yeah. giving yourself credit for the invention? Yeah. Yeah. Are, yeah. are you recommending your own thing? Are yeah. you selling your own product? Are you, uh, you know, how, what, what, is, what is what's going on here? And that's... Um, Sometimes you uh, you you find some stuff you don't want to find, but the, for me, you know, sometimes I find I find great stuff that really means a lot to me. So and it's exciting finding that stuff. See, that's that's for me is what is it, as much work as it is. And people are like, oh my god, you read all this stuff, but when I find that and figure that stuff out, or find that other that better source with with a more truthful version of events, oh my god, I get so excited. Yeah, I really, I, I, I love it. I find research to be the most exciting, thrilling thing. But I also read for fun, so you know, that's take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> research is an adventure. It really is. It, for me, it absolutely yeah. is. And it, I really, really think it is. And, you know, so other people might like bungee jumping. Who knows? But for me, I'm like, oh, ooh, when I find that, that like when that, that book, that quote, whatever it is. Oh, I, get, I love it. The, this is my constant refrain on, on the Sword and Laser podcast is uh, there isn't such a thing as a good book and a bad book. Uh, the, there may be bad writing where you can say like, well, mm-hmm. the characters were flat or, or the writing was very passive. There, there are some objective criteria there, but you know, once the basics are met on, on the mechanics, it's all about what we bring to the story. Yes. That's whether we Absolutely. enjoy it or not. And someone may legitimately not enjoy a story that doesn't make it a bad story. It means it wasn't for them. Uh, and I, I would say the same for adventure. You know, some people need to bring <laughs> bungee jumping to it. Other people, you know, can get it, get it out of research. And neither one are wrong. Yeah. See, yeah, I don't have to leave, even leave my house. I can get adventure just sitting in with a big dusty stack of books. <laughs> uh, well, before we wrap up, uh, I like to play a little word game. Are are, are you in? Can, can oh, I, I love word games. Uh, this one's very simple. Uh, it's called This or That. I'm going to give you two options and you tell me which one you would pick and why. Sounds good to me. All right. We start with Swamp Monster or River Dragon. Oh, Swamp Monster. Mm. I mean, I'm a little biased. I was trying to find something <laughs> that might tempt you away from Swamp Monster, and I just, yeah, I wasn't able it's to It's hard it. to tempt me away from Swamp Monster. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but why, why, I mean, we know you wrote the book about, you know, the lady, of the black lagoon and you're, I, and people probably may know that you're a horror fan, but, but why is that? Well, I'll tell you right now, it is, it's just one word. It's the word monster. I am very attracted to that word and all that word means, um, in our society, a uh, monster is something that is outside of society. Um, and whether that's for good or for bad and, um, 
as a person who likes a lot of alternative things. I grew, I am, grew up and I'm still, you know, a goth, a metalhead and didn't feel. And my response to the perception of all of the things wrong with society was to not want to participate in it. And therefore I got very attracted to alternative lifestyles and alternative scenes and communities. So the idea of a monster is very personally attractive to me. And, um, you know, when and I love all the universal monsters, I love monster movies, I love horror, and I love anything with that concept because of it. Uh, we're going to have to have you back and we'll just do a whole show with the word monster. I think that would be- I was going to say, please. Yeah, oh, yeah. L- next year for Halloween. Okay. Yeah. Uh, per- the perfect. Uh, this one I ask everybody, but it's, it is, uh, appropriate in, in this vein, fast or slow zombies. Slow. Because to me, they are scarier. Ah, uh, okay. All right. And I love being scared and they're, um, I just don't think a To me, it doesn't, I I have a hard time suspending my disbelief for the fast zombies. Um, But for me, the like relentless, but slow Mm -hmm. onslaught of zombies is much scarier than something coming at you fast. You know, something that um, is very slow, but will not stop is very freaky to me. Yeah. It's, it's, (laughs) I almost said erosion personified, but I I think that doesn't make it sound scary enough, but it's that, that like (laughs) relentlessness, like you say. Yeah. Uh, Plus I don't know how fast zombies maintain their muscle tone. That just doesn't. That's what I mean. I feel like they'd fall apart pretty quick. Uh, number three, jump scares or brain scares brain scares. I, Mm. um, I really don't like jump scares, um, especially because almost every jump scare in movies now is auditory. Um, it's, uh, it would not be as jump scary without the, like that kind of noise that happens. Uh, and I am, I'm a very easily startled person. Um, I, my, My boyfriend, Jeremy, has to walk around the house going, I'm coming down the stairs because I'm very easily startled. So I do not like that feeling, but I do like being scared. Uh, I love that feeling. Mm -hmm. So something that is um, horrifying um, rather than startling is much, much more appealing to me. And that goes with the slow zombies, right? They, they, you know, they're not they're less of a jump scare and and more of like just a, a persistent uh, persistent threat. Do you, do you, yes. have you put in any, uh, like professional kitchen methods, like saying corner when you, when you come around a corner? Oh, yeah. Sort. I mean, it's sort of like that. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, all, the other thing too, is I don't hear super well. Mm. Um, I'm starting to, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming hard of hearing. So I, I feel like I, sometimes I miss some of the cues, the auditory cl- clues that are leading up to the jump scare. Um, and uh, so I'm extra startled by it. <laughs> and uh, so I, I really, um, ugh, yeah, do not like it. Uh, chopsticks or tweezers for Cheetos? Oh, you know this answer. Chopsticks. <laughs> I eat almost all of my snacks with chopsticks. Um, I do not like things touching my hands. And I am a huge Flamin' Hot Cheeto fan. So we are, uh, I almost use chopsticks more for Cheetos than I do for <laughs> like, like an entree. <laughs> Uh, have you seen She-Hulk yet? No, but as soon as that episode dropped, I had multiple people tag me. We have a, a really great Slack channel for the paid members of uh, read, the Reading Glasses community, the people who like pay every month to help us make the show. And immediately, as soon, the day those episodes came out, a thread formed of people going, oh my God, she's eating Cheetos like Mallory. <laughs> yeah. If nothing else, you just need to watch that YouTube clip of, of, of that scene. Um I mean, it's the superior way to consume Cheetos. Absolutely. Yeah. Savory or dessert crepes? Oh, savory. I am not, I don't have a sweet tooth. So um, I love, I will almost in any situation opt for a savory thing. Yeah. I I used to be a hundred percent on the savory side. I have been convinced to try some sweet crepes that were pretty good. So I, you know, you're getting, you're getting convinced by the sweet crepe lobby. I'm opening my mind. I'm still on the savory (laughs) side, but yeah. You know, sometimes like a strawberry crepe is nice. Like I don't not like sweet crepes, but I, or something. Yeah. Yeah. I just prefer cheese in almost any given situation. (laughs) Uh, whiskey or whiskey. In other words, with an E or without an E? Uh, whiskey with an E because only because I'm a huge bourbon fan. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I know you're the Scotch guy, I so am. you yeah. you were, you were whiskey with just a Y, um, but I I am bourbon, so I will take whiskey with an E. I uh, I I I am by whiskey. <laughs> I, I do drink bourbon, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do prefer a Scotch. Yeah. <laughs> Tom swings both ways it's a when it comes to whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. Uh, dogs or cats? <sighs> It's, t- you know, it's so funny because I have two cats who are the light of my life. Me and my boyfriend have these two rescue cats that I found in an alleyway in Los Angeles five years ago. And they are my world. My cat Lula is, she literally runs my life. Anything that she wants, she gets. Um, but I also like dogs. I grew up having dogs as pets always. Uh, so people always are like, oh, well, you must be a cat person. I'm like, yeah, but I also, I, you know, I love dogs. I, I feel the same way about cats and dogs as you feel about whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. It's Spectrum. A, I, I was, grew, I grew up in a cat household uh, and was a little afraid of dogs. Uh, we are now a dog household. No, pets. I was going to say now you're a dog yeah. household. So uh, I, I definitely can. The pets are great. That that's yeah, know. yeah. That's what I mean. Is I mean any kind. Give me anything, Bird, f- anything furry, fluffy, feathery. Hamster, I'll take it. Yeah. Uh, finally, hot or cold? Uh, hot. I'm one of those people that's constantly cold. Mm-hmm. So um, I like to me, my perfect day is like. 85 87 degrees my boyfriend's perfect day is like 44 degrees oh wow yeah so i i love to me that's like a normal day but for uh most people that's too hot but oh man i love a hot day yeah that that must be tough to uh to, on your thermostat Oh, it is a constant. I mean, it, it truly is a constant fight. We have, I'm sure many other couples have this, but for me, um, you know, sometimes I will, I will have an extra blanket just on my side of the bed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, Mallory, thank you so much. This was, uh, this was super fun as I knew it would be. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat. Oh, anytime. Let's next year for Halloween. Let's do monster. I, yeah, I always I would love, love talking to you, Tom. Absolutely. Uh, it, to let folks know where they can find your works, follow what you're doing, get the reading glasses podcast, you know, tell them, tell them the best place to go. If you just go to MalloryOmero.com, that's where all my stuff is. Um, I'm at Mallory O'Mara on Twitter, too much probably, on Instagram, all that stuff. But MalloryOmero.com has, has all the things. You can find reading glasses. You can find my books. You can find all my stuff there. And it's O-M-E-A-R-A, right? Yes. Thank you oh. for asking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or thank you for clarifying. <laughs> of course. Uh, Mallory, thanks so much. Thank you. And thanks to our producers, Jen Cutter and Anthony Lemos. Thank you for listening to the show and telling your friends about it. You can get an ad-free version of this show and special bonus outtakes from this episode with Acast Plus. Click on access exclusive content at awordpodcast.com. We'll have a word with you next time. Because first I'm like, that's all for, again, I can't swear. Um, That's (laughs)